important notes about online learning. Download the slides and go through them along with your video and audio. You will still need to make notes and try and express things in your own words. This is going to be important for your own understanding of the work. You still need to go through your manual and do the work points, and you still need to explore further through additional reading and online investigation. For example, YouTube, Wikipedia, and the library have wonderful resources for you to use. While doing online learning, it becomes even more important that you do these things. You will need to manage your own time and take more responsibility for your own learning. Enjoy the lecture. The building blocks of sentences, words, and phrases. Part two, constituency. Thus far in this lecture, we have been looking at identifying categories of words, but words themselves can combine into larger chunks, which tend to behave as single units, and we would call this a constituent. Constituents tend to follow each other in a linear order, so I like to call them a chunk of words. They tend to move around together in a sentence, and each constituent is centered around a word that we call the head. So for instance, a verb phrase will have a verbal head. A noun phrase will have a noun head. A prepositional phrase will have a preposition as its head. An adverbial phrase would have an adverb as its head, etc. In other words, verb phrases behave a little bit like verb. Noun phrases behave a little bit like nouns. Prepositional phrases behave a little bit like prepositions, etc. There is a wide variety of evidence for constituency. It tends to be language specific and depends on the rules of that particular language. Here are a few that we'll be doing in this lecture relating to English. They are substitution with a pronoun or pub, substitution with a pronoun or proform, or substitution with a question word, movement, sentence fragments, ellipsis, coordination, and it clicks. Let's look at each of these. Evidence of constituency substitution. So a pronoun or proform tends to be words like he, she, it, they, we, etc. And a pronoun can replace a noun phrase constituent in a sentence, but it cannot replace a non-constituent. So when we are able to replace a chunk of words with a pronoun, it suggests that we are dealing with a noun phrase constituent. Here's an example. We could say, I will not tolerate that kind of behavior from my children. We could paraphrase it by saying, I will not tolerate it, where we've used the pronoun it to replace the chunk of words, that kind of behavior from my children. And this suggests that this chunk of words is a constituent of some kind. In this case, probably a noun phrase. You could paraphrase the sentence by saying, I will not tolerate that kind of behavior from them. Who does re them refer to? Well, it refers to my children, another noun phrase. You could also substitute with a known alternative form. So let's imagine from my children is a chunk of words, and you're not really sure, is that a noun phrase or a prepositional phrase? But you do know that at the wedding is indeed a prepositional phrase. In that case, you can try and swap the phrase you do know with the one you don't know. So this will give us I will not tolerate that kind of behavior at the wedding. And this makes sense. It is a grammatical sentence. And then that suggests that since it's grammatical, that the substitution has been felicitous. Or alternatively, you might want to say that the substitution has, has worked out. It makes sense. And then this suggests that the substituted item is a prepositional phrase. So the logic of this is that we are taking something we don't know and we're replacing it with something that we do know. And if they behave in the same way, then we can infer that the two things must be the same. Here's another example. Uh, if you take the sentence, I will not tolerate the kind of behavior from my children, we might not be sure what kind of constituent it is. We can also replace it with another noun phrase. So for instance, we know that a film is a noun phrase. It's got a determinant and a noun that we're familiar with. Can we substitute it? For instance, I will not tolerate a film to be shown during the lecture. The fact that we can substitute one chunk with another chunk shows that these chunks are logically the same. And if we know one is a noun phrase, it follows that the other one must be a noun phrase too. Let's look at another kind of evidence for constituency using substitution with a question word. And this type of evidence draws from the fact that in English, when you are asking questions, we often use something called WH words, words like who, what, where, when, how, etc. And these WH words gives a clue as to the constituents we might be dealing with. So let's start off with our base sentence. I will not tolerate that kind of behavior from my children. And we might ask a question such as, what will you not tolerate? And the answer would be that kind of behavior from my children. 
So what has happened here is you've taken the chunk that kind of behavior and you've replaced it with a pro form, namely a question word, what, and that should indicate to us that this is a constituent. Incidentally, that question word has also moved to the front of the sentence, which is something that should be aware of and will become more important as we go along. You could also ask a question like, who will you not tolerate that behavior from? And the answer might be something like, well, my kids or my children. Again, what has happened here is we've taken the constituent or the chunk of words, my kids, and it has been replaced by the pro form who, and then that pro form has, or that question word has moved to the front of the sentence. This suggests then that my kids is actually a constituent. Another question we could phrase might be something like, what will you not do? And the answer would be, tolerate that kind of behavior from my children. Once again, we'll see that we've taken a chunk of words and we've replaced it with a question word or pro form, what? And then of course that question word has moved to the front of the sentence. But the fact that you can substitute it tells us that tolerate that kind of behavior must be a constituent of some kind. Now on the previous slide I talked about movement and that brings us to another kind of evidence uh, for constituency. Namely that in sentences in English and pretty much in many other languages, words and phrases can move around a bit. And if they move together as a chunk, it shows that they are a constituent. So let's have a look at our sentence. I will not tolerate that kind of behavior from my children. And I've put this part in yellow just so that you focus on that. And we can also take that yellow part and front it. By fronting, I mean we move that chunk to the front of the sentence. And you get something like this. That kind of behavior I will not tolerate from my children. Now the fact that it can move around shows that it is a constituent. You could also say, I will not tolerate from my children that kind of behavior. In this case, we have taken the chunk of words and postposed it. By postposed, I mean that they, we have just put it at the end of the sentence. And again, we can see that this chunk tends to move around together. All the words associated with it kind of cluster together. And this shows that this chunk must be a constituent. Needless to say, only phrasal constituents can be moved and either preposed or postposed, and non-constituents cannot be moved. Here is an example of that. If we take this sentence, I will not tolerate that kind of behavior from my children, and try and move from and children, but leave the word my behind. So what's happening here is that we've moved some parts of the chunk, but left other parts behind. What we'll notice is that, that the sentence becomes ungrammatical, and you get from children, I will not tolerate my that kind of behavior. And that, of course, is ungrammatical. And that shows us that this is a constituent, which you cannot just break up in any way you want. So only phrasal constituents moved and non-constituents cannot be moved. Evidence of constituency using sentence fragments. Under appropriate circumstances, for instance, when you're answering a question, constituents can serve as sentence fragments and non-constituents cannot serve as sentence fragments. So what does this mean? Well, sometimes when you answer a question, you don't answer in full sentences. You just answer in a very short way. Let's have a look. Who will you not tolerate that behavior from? The answer could be my children. So my children here is a sentence fragment. It doesn't include a verb. It's really not answering in full sentences. But it's actually quite significant that we can do that. And of course, at school, this would have driven your teachers nuts. Um, teachers always say things like, please answer in full sentences. And while that's great, that's not what people actually do in practice. So this kind of answer is actually a very normal kind of answer that someone might give to that kind of question. But it also tells us something particularly important. It tells us that my children must be a constituent. In this case, a noun phrase. You could also respond to that question by saying, from my children. So who will you not tolerate that behavior from? From my children. Again, this is a sentence fragment, but it also tells us that this is a prepositional phrase. So putting these two pieces of information together, we can see that a prepositional phrase must include a noun phrase. I could ask a question like, what will you not do? And the answer might be, tolerate that kind of behavior. We can see that this is a sentence fragment because it's an incomplete sentence, but it does start with the verb tolerate and it has an object after it, which suggests that this could be a verb phrase. Do you remember the verb phrase rule? A verb phrase breaks into a verb and a noun phrase. So we can see that tolerate is the verb and that kind of behavior must be a noun. Another question, what will you not tolerate? And the answer could be that kind of behavior. Another sentence fragment, in this case, a noun phrase. So all these sentence fragments show that the things that are fragments must also be constituents. 
Evidence of constituency using ellipsis. Sometimes when you're speaking, it is possible to elide a constituent or a chunk of words from the sentence. The word elide simply means delete. For instance, if we take a sentence like, I won't tolerate that kind of behavior from my kids, someone might retort, huh, I bet you would. Now, let's think about that response. I bet you would. I bet you would what exactly? And anyone knows who speaks English that what is actually meant is, I bet you would tolerate that kind of behavior from your kids. So the phrase, tolerate that kind of behavior from your kids, has been elided or deleted in this retort, I bet you would. So if we assume then that only constituents can be deleted, then this kind of elision behavior or deletion behavior can give you a clue that there might be constituents involved. In some ways, this is very similar to the sentence fragment test we discussed earlier. Evidence of constituency using coordination. Coordination is the construction where there's an and, X and Y, Jack and Jill, paint and brush, etc. And one of the interesting things about coordination is that it will only link together constituents of the same type. So for instance, you can say something like, the pig and the sheep walk down the road. That would be a noun phrase and a noun phrase. And together these act as one big coordinated noun phrase. However, you can't take a verb and a noun and coordinate those. So something like, the pig and eight walk down the road. Similarly, you can say, the pig danced and pirouetted down the road. Danced is a verb, pirouetted is a verb, and so we're coordinating two verb phrases here. It would be very odd to take a noun and a verb and coordinate those. So you'd get something like, the pig danced and pig down the road. That really wouldn't work very well. So the way that you can use coordination to test if something is a constituent or not is to try and coordinate it with another constituent that you do know about. So if you have a noun phrase, like the pig, then you can try and coordinate it with a noun phrase that you know, such as the sheep. And if you can coordinate it, then these must be constituents. If you can't coordinate it, they probably aren't. Constituency tests using it clefts. In English, we have a construction known as the cleft, which has the following kind of format. It is the printer that is broken. It is the paper that is dirty. It is my sister who came to the party. This is the basic cleft structure. You have a it is something followed by an embedded clause introduced by the word that or who or another complementizer, which you will remember from part one of the lecture. So if you take a sentence like the following, I will not tolerate that kind of behavior from my kids. And then we might want to try and turn that into a cleft. We could rephrase it as it is from my kids that I will not tolerate that kind of behavior. In this instance, we have taken a prepositional phrase from my kids and fronted it or put it in front of the clause uh, in that first clefting position. And this shows us that that chunk of words must be a constituent. And by now we can identify that as a prepositional phrase. We could also phrase a cleft as the following. It is that kind of behavior that I will not tolerate. In this instance, we've taken the chunk of words, that kind of behavior, and we've moved that to the front of the sentence and created a cleft around it. And this shows us that that kind of behavior must be a constituent. And by now we, be, we would be able to identify that as a noun phrase too. Here's another example. It is my kids that I won't tolerate that kind of behavior from. In this instance, we've taken the noun phrase complement of the preposition and moved that to the clefting position. And this shows us that my kids must be a constituent, namely a noun phrase. Just like many of the other constituency tests we've been looking at during this lecture, non-constituents cannot be clefted. So for instance, in the following example, what has happened is that we've taken a string of words, namely behavior from my kids, and we've moved it to the front of the sentence to create the clefting construction. But you'll notice that it is strongly ungrammatical as indicated by the little star. It is behavior from my kids that I won't tolerate that kind of. If you are a fluent speaker of English, you should experience this as being ungrammatical and it should sound really awkward and maybe even meaningless. What this tells us is that behavior from my kids is a string of words that is not a constituent. So now we can identify the following types of constituents, noun phrases, prepositional phrases, verb phrases, adverbs, and you'll also know how to identify a number of these from your tutorial. So we can draw all of this together by drawing a syntactic tree of a sentence that we've been talking about in the last lecture. So let's pull all this together 
uh, by looking at the following sentence, I will not tolerate that behavior from my kids. And we're going to commit to start off with a piece of rough work. Always start off with a piece of rough. Never try and draw a tree directly from scratch because it puts a lot of pressure on you and it's really not necessary. So let's start off by looking at the sentence. It looks quite complicated at first, but we can break it into smaller parts. So for instance, can we see a verb? Um, well, it's a, there's, a main, there's a main verb over here, tolerate. And how do we know it's a verb? How we, can we prove it? Well, we can test it morphologically by put a, putting it before a to, to tolerate is uh, an infinitive form and that works well. We can also substitute another verb in it. Um, for instance, we might know that um, accept is a verb. Okay. And so we can say, I will not accept that behavior from my, my, my kids. Or we can just put in a ver another verb uh, completely, for instance, to run. We know run is a doing word. And you can remove this part of it. And we can say, I will not run. And that would show that tolerate is a, probably a verb. So that's the first thing we want to look at. Uh, not is going to be a negation. Will, we know it's a modal. And we know it's a modal because we can do subject verb inversion. So you could write something like the following will I will I tolerate it? And you can see that in the sentence the will has moved to the front of the sentence. Okay, so that shows that that's a modal. But we know that I is a pronoun. All right, so that's a kind of a noun. And it's probably in a noun phrase. Are there any other noun phrases here? Well, let's look at this thing here, that behavior. And how can we show that that's a noun phrase? Well, we could substitute it with a pronoun. And I really, I really did it over here. Um, and I've, you can say, I will not tolerate it. We can replace that, that behavior with it. It is a pronoun. So we know that this is also a noun phrase. My kids is, is another noun phrase. You can identify kids as a noun uh, because it's a thing. And it also takes a plural morpheme, one kid, two kids. So that also suggests that we're dealing with a noun phrase. Okay. Then what about this word here, from? One way of trying to work out what this category is, is to look at our various rules and um, what rules would put a a form like this before a noun phrase. So actually, this is the rule we might be looking at. Okay, so this rule says a prepositional phrase consists of a preposition followed by a noun phrase. We have a noun phrase here. We have something that looks suspiciously like a preposition. So this whole thing could be a prepositional phrase. And, and what we've done that's really important is we have also try to work out what the parts of speech are and the various structures here but we've also tried to provide evidence for that so it's not just that we've guessed we will work things through fairly systematically so we can be persuasive and to prove that things are nouns or things are words so to summarize sentences are not just sequences of words but have their own internal structure and language is structure dependent Constituents are groups of words or phrases that combine together and can be demonstrated to be some type of unit in the sentence. All these constituents are called phrases and phrases have heads. So for instance, a verb phrase has a verb as a head. A noun phrase has a noun as a head. A prepositional phrase has a preposition as a head, etc. We can identify these constituents using a variety of linguistic tests and these constituents can be combined into bigger and bigger recursive structures to create syntactic tree diagrams that represent the underlying structure of the language that we use every day.